the conversation coming up next. Mr. George Norrie, this is Ian Punnett, Coast to Coast AM. are working on solutions to get rid of the smell along the Dominguez Channel in Carson. Decomposing our tents and surely the channel appears to be broken. Public Works Director Mark Pastrella says crews are going to aerate the water to help get rid of the scent. Injecting air into the water, oxygen into the water, will accelerate the remediation and will ultimately reduce the smell and annoyance of the hydrogen sulfide. People started complaining of the smell about a week ago. The Dodgers' win over the Giants means Governor Newsom has to make good on a bet with California's junior senator, Alex Padilla. Padilla tweeted he's looking forward to welcoming Newsom to L.A. to help get Dodger Stadium ready for the National League Championship Series. Newsom tweeted he'll start warming up for his infield ranking duties. KFI weather, sunny this afternoon. It will get to around 80 at the beaches to mid-90s for the metro L.A. O.C. area as well as the valley. High 80s and low 90s if you're in the Inland Empire. We lead local from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. I'm Andrew Caravella. All in closed downtown LA, the northbound side of the 101 between the 5 and 1st Street. The south end works till around 6 a.m. Southbound side shut down as well between the 10 and the 5 till around 7 o'clock in the morning. Take the 5 over to 110 instead. All lanes still shut down through Burbank, so on the 5 southbound between Burbank Boulevard and Olive Avenue. They should be wrapping up this closure in the next little while, but in the meantime, you are seeing sudden delays to approach. And Santa Monica, the eastbound side of the 10, shut down from the Mercure Tunnel to uh, the 4th Street until around 7 o'clock. Can you find the sky? Help get there faster. I'm Robert Kibucky. True. You know what's really spooky during Halloween? What, Dad? Your old mattress. Because after eight years, an old mattress loses support and comfort. And you select sweat, dead skin, and satisfy. So if your mattress is over eight, it's time to replace during City Fleet Fall Sale. Save $1,000 on select mattresses from GDRX, Cinco, and Sealy. And get a $300 gift with any temperature of purchase. So this Halloween season, trust your sleep to City Fleet. For winning the machine, that pumpkin spice latte. That sounds good, girl. And go present that you didn't know. Bet you didn't know that your car's transmission is made up of 800 pieces. Also, bet you didn't know that Amco's fixed over 40 million transmissions.
children of the sun.
Help this nation to never forget its greatest heroes. Do good in their honor. Donate $11 a month to Tunnel for Towers at T2T.org. That's T, the number 2, T.org. Open lines on Coast to Coast AM. We start off with Walt in Allentown. Walt, before you get going, let me ask you, how many times have you already been on Coast to Coast this week? I haven't been on at all this week. Oh, really? So this is your, okay. All right. Well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, where are you going to take us, Walt? You, you may be thinking of Cornelius. No, no, I talk to you enough that I know you're a regular, so I wasn't sure how regular you were, that's all. So, Professor Punnett, uh, you make me feel uh, young whenever I speak to you. I look forward to it. It's, uh, even though I think I'm about 10 years older than you are, uh, <laughs> you make me feel like I'm back in college. <laughs> Good. Uh, 15 years ago, talking to my prof, so uh, I always look forward to it. I just want to say that... Uh, as I was saying to Donna, uh, you know, the psychologist tell us about, uh, you know, the power of suggestion and right. I think that applies to the masses just as it does to the individual. Uh, you know, I think these mass sightings have to be taken, the mass UFO sightings have to be taken with a grain of salt. I think they can be compared to, uh, you know, the miraculous sightings of the Virgin Mary of Fatima and Lourdes. And uh, you know what I mean. I just think you have to take it with a grain of salt. I'm in this. I'm in this camp with Dr. Seth Gilstack and Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and the late Dr. Carl Sagan. Uh, they obviously agree. You know, Dr. Seth Gilstack wouldn't be involved in Seti if he didn't believe that there was life out there somewhere. And uh, but I think that the danger is uh, uh, in abandoning the. Uh, what I call the skeptical scrutiny, the, the backbone of science. And I think, uh, sadly, that's what the late Stanton Friedman and uh, J. Allen Heidnick did. Uh, I don't you know, know I, that. I don't know that Heidnick was, you would ever have put him in the category of somebody who had abandoned science. In fact, it was science that led him to that inquiry. You know, he, he was every bit the PhD that Neil deGrasse Tyson or others are and he kept seeing a repetition and that's what you look for in science right you look for you look for those patterns and out of those patterns you can start to draw some conclusions it doesn't mean they're not subject to revision but but I want to I want to dismiss something you said because I, I think when people you're talking about Saturn or you're talking about Lords you're talking about people gathering with the intent of having an experience. People weren't gathering in Tinley Park to see a UFO. So when you say that it's like a kind of mass hysteria, well, it, it would be, you know, what belies that is that it wasn't just Tinley Park, that it was a series of places along what appeared to be a kind of a line, and Tinley Park, where they caught something on video, is just part of it and the fact that they were coming in without any coordination the reports were coming in without anybody knowing that anybody else had called it in would be completely unlike the Fatima or the Lord's type of religious experience right well, Ian, when, when you go to Fatima you sort of expect a miracle or, or right. a Lord you know uh, okay they yeah. used to say when you go to Lourdes, you can see the, uh, you know, the crutches hanging, the thousands of crutches hanging. Okay. On, uh, whether that's... That's my point. placebo effect or whatever. Whatever. Whatever, but that's my point. People go there for that. I'm not arguing for the legitimacy of those types of miracles. What I'm saying is that when you look up into the sky and you see something and you're in Tinley Park and then you, um, moments later, somebody in Orland Park, which is miles away, sees the same thing, it's not mass hysteria, right? It's not a bunch of people who are connecting 
a place to an experience like they would be at Lourdes. Well, it, in 1938, when Orson Welles uh, had his uh, hopes over the airwaves, uh, you know, about landing in, uh, I forget the name of the town in New Jersey, mm -hmm. all over the country, people claim that they, you know, that they were landing all over the country, so, you know, I, I think we have to just... Uh, yeah, yeah, but even that, hold on a second, even that, what you're quoting, is actually not true. Which is like, so I want to, I want to, they weren't saying, I see UFOs landing in my town. They were necessarily all over the country, people who, it wasn't a hoax, by the way. Remember, it was the Mercury Theater of the Air. It was a regular show. Up until this point, the Mercury Theater of the Air had been doing very high-minded repertory kind of things like Shakespeare. And they were... They were kind of being encouraged by the network to do something a little bit more popular. So they took H.G. Wells' story and decided to, to contemporize it. And they, they told it, um, it, it they, you know, they changed the key parts of it, and they made it into what it was. But it was never a hoax. It was, they had commercial breaks, they stopped for commercials, they announced it was the Mercury Theater of the Air, and now we're back to our broadcast. So it was never intended to be that. It's just people that weren't paying attention got captivated by it and started to get panicked. But again, that wouldn't be mass hysteria. Well, right? it was a form. You have to agree that it was, what Orson Welles did was science fiction. I mean, it wasn't science fact. Well, of course, but that was, it was a play, it was fiction. It was intended to be fiction. You know, that caused nationwide panic. It didn't, though, and this is a myth. It didn't, and this is why, I mean, first of all, it aired at different time zones, right? So it, 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 it did not air simultaneously across the whole country. And so it, 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 came in, it came in waves, depending on the time zone, just like a show would tonight that would run on network television, and they stagger the time for the time zone. So it was it was recorded and, passed, and then replayed at a later time. But part of what you're referring to is actually what happened later on when they played it in South America. For example, everybody loves to say, well, there were suicides that night. There weren't any suicides attributed to it in the United States. There was one person, I think when they played it in Brazil, or they did a version of it in Brazil, there was that there was a suicide. But I think part of the myth, it, oddly enough, you're passing along and debunking a myth, you're using a myth. So, I mean, I think that Orson Welles and others, again, they didn't create mass hysteria, uh, and they, it, 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 it's a good way to tell the story, and it makes people sound foolish, but most people are smarter than that. And when they're going to call in seeing an overhead light in Tinley Park, it doesn't mean that they're crazy. It doesn't mean that they're having some sort of, you know, um, ecstatic experience. They're just, they saw something and they told somebody about it. Why would we not think that that's legit? Well, I think as a species, our history shows that we quote unquote, we need to believe in something. We're the only animal with a conscience, with a consciousness, so to speak. And, uh, you know, we, man has, uh, since uh, time immemorial, has uh, the only species that asks the question, who am I, where did I come from, et cetera. So I think we're like, uh, you know, you can compare it to people wandering in the Sahara Desert and they get so thirsty and, and uh, you know, so sunburned that they begin to see mirages of lakes and oases where none really exist. So I think that's part of, uh, you know, psychologically you can explain it that way. Well, but we all, we've all looked down a, we've all looked down a hot asphalt road in the summer and saw a shimmer that looked like a pool of water. So it, do they see an oasis or... Or, you know, or, or did you just see the shimmer that comes off of the ground with, with the thermal heat that's being released up into the air that causes that reaction? 
And I don't think they have to be crazy to see that. They see what they see. But I, I mean, like, you have to remember in the first hour, my oldest son is on, he's 30. He is not a religious guy in search of something to believe in. And he's, that's not his nature at all. Um, he's never been that way since he was a small child. He's, he doesn't spend any time reading the Bible. He doesn't identify as a Christian. Um, it, it, from when I used to pick him up from Sunday school when he was a kid, he used to say, Hey, Dad, do you believe this story we heard today from the Bible? And I would talk to him about it, and after he goes, he said, I don't. I don't believe that story. And so I think the fact he was caught off guard by what he saw, it wasn't, he wasn't pursuing that experience. He just saw it. And so he reported what he saw. Isn't that exactly what we would want from a scientific mind? Yeah, I think, you know what I mean, uh, we have a consciousness. We're the only animal. I get you know, that. The gentleman was talking about time, and we're the only animal that's aware of time. We're the only animal that's How do we know that? aware of birth and death. <laughs> no, you don't have any empirical evidence to say nobody else... No other animal understands birth or death or time. I mean, the fact that, as I say, everything is seasonal, that's exactly how I would think animals would experience time, much like how we did before the Industrial Revolution, which, you know, there's a season, for example, of animals for for migration. There's a season for estrus. There's a season for all sorts of different things. I think they're aware of birth and death and... You know, no, none, if they weren't if they weren't afraid of dying, they wouldn't flee from a predator, right? Well, that's, that's instinctual. You, well, you know, I can agree that the, the great apes take like their are in their throats of the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the orangutans. You could say that they have the flickerings of conscience. If you look at their interactions, they, you know, they, they haven't written down the Ten Commandments, but they instinctually follow a, 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 what you might say, quote-unquote, a code of ethics. Maybe, so, but I think you're, it, it, interestingly enough, in trying to challenge other people on the basis of a lack of um, empirical data, you're also committing the same sin. You don't know those things. We, we presume, you could presume them, but I think we, any of us could look at an animal that would very much want to live and say that they have some awareness beyond instinct that says, you know, for example, a, 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 I, my son has a, a cat who doesn't like to go outside now because he lives in the city, and every time that my son wants to take him out, the, the cat's like, whoop, see ya. And he, he jumps behind the refrigerator or whatever, he doesn't want to go outside. So, I mean, I, I think that's not instinct. That's a kind of sense memory. And I think that we need to give more credit to other creatures and other people than I well, think you're willing to do. Do you think, do you think uh, when, a hen lays, uh, when a hen sets on an egg that the hen is aware that it, the egg will hatch into a chick? Yes. Do you think the hen is actually aware of that? Yes. Why? Well, because when I uh, took, uh, I guess I went to obviously a different uh, college than you did. Well, uh, when I had behavioral psychology in college, the prof told us that uh, in, on the bird skin there are nodules, uh, you know, connected to the nervous system, and when she sits on the egg, it uh, sort of uh, alleviates the itch there, if you want to say. The, the, uh, the senses okay. on the skin, uh, you know, cause her to lay on the egg. Not because she, she does, obviously, she doesn't have the intelligence to realize that there's a chicken there that's going to hatch. But well, sitting on that, because you can take, you can take a, a billiard balls and substitute them for the egg and she'll do the same thing. Well, I'll leave that there for now because I didn't take that course with you back in college. But I'll, I'll look into that. I, I, I think that that's only part of the story, not the whole story or 
you know, if, that, if, if chickens were that stupid, they wouldn't mind it when a fox gets into the hen house. Uh, all right, leave it there. Let me get to Shane in, uh, but pleasure talking with you. As always, Shane is in Australia on the international line on Coast to Coast. Shane? Yeah, you know, we love your program and love your, um, your ability to try to find out what the real truth is. Um, my field has been over the last quite a couple, few decades is looking at the generational social psychological conditioning of the Australian social system. And I try to help this basically addiction and I look at it through a modern Pavlovian. But basically in the behaviour...